three ways to teach the lock left better. Number one, drill skills, game reads. I'll say it again, drill skills and game reads. Most coaches default to dr doing drills when they identify a weakness in their defense. So for example, Jason, a really good coach, um, identified a weakness in that they weren't denying one pass to the right of the ball well enough um, and, they, and the opponents were getting ball reversals. So immediately what coaches tend to want to do is like, okay, what's a drill where we can just focus on that one thing? Well, then if we do a drill, we just focus on that one thing, right? Where we put an individual on the spot, you know, we have a coach with the ball and they have to deny the pass to the right um, as people rotate through the spot. Here's what I guarantee when you run a drill. That player is going to do really well on that drill, right? And I, I think that if we can just as coaches really step out and encourage, because it does take courage, because when we run a drill, like for example, um, let's say we're turning the ball over a lot, right? And we're like, oh man, we're, we're just, we're throwing the ball to the other team. We got to do more passing drills. And so we'll do three man weave or we'll put them in lines and they'll work on passing accuracy or we'll go like monkey in the middle and stuff. Right. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, good. We did a passing drill. I feel better about our chances in this next game to not turn the ball over as much. And guess what happens? <laughs> we turn the ball over the same amount. We all know this to be true or get like incrementally better because the, and here's why, this is it. This is why we drill for skills, which I'll, I'll go deeper in, but we game for reads because players in games don't fail because they lack the physical skills. They fail because they aren't making the right reads. And so when we just do a drill, what we're actually doing is we're eliminating all the reads and the confusion that actually happen in real games that cause them to make a mistake, right? Like in a real game, they've got to, they got to fight through a screen. They got to communicate a switch um, after they sprinted back in transition and picked up a different player than they had before. And that's why they get confused and vacate their spot where they're supposed to be in deny because there's unscripted things that are happening. That's where the mistake comes from. Whereas if we remove all of these unscripted, random, chaotic things, of course they're going to do it correctly, but that won't transfer to a game because we're not addressing the problem. So how do we fix this is we've got to create games that are random, that we aren't, we aren't necessarily scripting, that are, going to, um, that are going to mirror what an actual game is as close as possible and then let them fail and let it look messy and let them make the same mistakes they're making in a game and then coach and correct what's actually happening as opposed to trying to create a drill where they're just going to have success. Create games where they're going to fail instead of creating drills where they're going to have success. So when should we use drills? When should we remove loads on them? Like, there, you know, there's, uh, there's mental loads, there's physical loads, right? There's psychological loads or social loads. When should we make it easier for them? When we're trying to improve their individual skill development. So like drill, if you're trying to tune up their shot, drill, if you're trying to teach them a dribble move, drill, if you're trying to teach them how to properly take a charge with the proper technique, okay, drill for skills, individual player skills, but game for reads. Claire, um, as a collegiate player and collegiate coach, just curious, what percent of your team's practices were drills versus games? Ours was um, very inconsistent, which uh, was an issue for a lot of players. So that was a, a coaching miss, I would say, for our team that we never know what to expect. We didn't know what a drill was for, what a game was for. Um, so things didn't transfer very well. So whoa, 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 whoa. You said, hang on, because this is a perfect segue into our second one. You said, when you were a player in college, um, players were unaware of what a drill was for or what a game was for. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I riff off that real quick? Point number two for us as coaches, objectives and feedback, objectives and feedback. Uh, I was working with a, a, another college team just recently and uh, I audited their practice. And at the end of the practice, uh, I, I sent them off so, some feedback myself. And I said, the biggest opportunity that I observed was a more clear objective in everything that you were doing. 
You know, as I sat in your film breakdown, each individual thing that was said made sense, but I didn't know how it fit into your objective. I didn't know what was most important. You know, as, as I, as I watched, you know, a drill or a competition, I was like, okay, that's a, your team's playing basketball, but what are you actually trying to get better at right now? You know, as, as you went through your, your stuff and you did your transition stuff and you did your finishing stuff and you did your shooting stuff, like, why are you doing it? And great coaches often fall down here they don't have a clear objective we're playing this four on three drill so that you can get better at shrinking the floor and not allowing ball reversals to the right that's what we're trying to get better at and then remember i said feedback this is this is tough coaches here it is limit your feedback to that objective because coaches fall down and mess up when they don't have a clear objective with their team before they do a, a drill or a game and then they fall down because they coach everything in that drill or that game. They undermine themselves. We all do it. Like we say, we're trying to focus on this, but then as a coach, we don't stay focused on this. We say, oh, you know, you didn't, you didn't crash the boards. Oh, you didn't box out. Oh, you didn't run our actions right. Oh, no, you, you do. chase five rabbits and you catch zero. And you wonder why you're not getting better. Like this is just an absolute cheat code or the lock left, but really anything that you're doing coaches, which is objective and feedback. And then that will allow you to actually see gains. You know, if we're trying to, if we're trying to get better at 10 different things at the end of 30 minutes, we didn't really make uh, any significant improvement, but if we can have a real clear objective and limit our feedback to that, you will see more improvement. Players will have more confidence and more belief you will then be able to know what you can what you can count on them to execute in games as opposed to just hoping. Um, so that's a key one. Claire, anything to add to that one? Or you can tell us how you guys did with your percentages between games and drills when you're uh, part of the coaching staff. Yeah, the complete opposite. We did what you said. <laughs> so going from a 0-16 team where the coach got fired because mm. nobody knew what was going on to coaching on a national championship level team. Uh, where it was, yeah, 20% skills. Then we have all of our individual sessions to focus on those skills and then really just getting into game specific reads in practice. I didn't even know that when I asked you. That's a powerful testimony. So I really appreciate you sharing that one. Okay, final, third way to teach the lock left, measure your focus. Measure your focus. Some of you, like me, may be married, okay? And it is hilarious when my wife and I try to recall a conversation that we had a few days ago and what we agreed upon. And, and it's and like, I'll be like, no, I'm pretty sure we said that we were going to the 10 o'clock service. And she'd be like, nope, we absolutely said we're going to the 8.30 service. Um, and because we don't actually measure it or document it, we tell ourselves stories based on which service we actually wanted to go to. And then we assume that that's what actually happened coaches we are the worst at this when we are recapping a practice or a game the thing that is going to get most of our attention is going to be our pet peeve that's the thing that we're going to remember that's the thing we're like oh i can't believe that we can't believe that we uh, didn't take any charges or whatever your pet peeve is and if we don't measure what we're actually focusing on then we're going to tell ourselves stories about whether or not we actually got better at it or not or if that's actually important or not like we cannot trust our gut. That's one of the worst things that we do as coaches is we just trust our gut. We trust our gut too much about who should play. We trust our gut too much about what we did well and what we did poorly. We trust our gut too much about um, what deserves more focus and practice time. So what it means to measure your focus is if you can't just feel if you got better at something, you can't just feel if you were able to put the ball left or not. You can't just feel if um, so-and-so was your, you know, your, your best chaser on the ball, whatever you're focusing on as a coach, you've got to measure it because we got to check ourselves. And second, once we measure it to check ourselves, then we've got to measure what our players are doing in a drill, because when we do that, it helps their improvement. So, uh, for example, um, we just did, uh, we did a drill recently with a high school team that I was, uh, that I was working with and we were competing for uh, the first team to get three stops in a row. 
And uh, it took us like two minutes for a team to get three stops in a row. And I was like, oh my goodness, we measured that. You guys were able to lock them down. We, we got three stops in a row in just two minutes. I said, okay, we're going to go up to four stops in a row. And I want to see if we can get a team to get four stops in a row in less than two minutes. And here's inevitably what happened. Their energy and their intensity went up. There was anything magical about like what we were measuring. It's just that we measured it and we had a goal that we we're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to focus on something, whether it be intensity, whether it be on ball pressure, whether it be deflections, whatever, just measure it. It's like all, all of us as, as individuals and coaches as well. We love these personality profiles, personal measurements, an Enneagram, a disc profile, whatever. It was like, oh, because the moment we measure something, we bring attention to it and we focus on it more. So find a way to measure. I see so many coaches just running drills and you've got an assistant coach on the sideline just repeating everything you say. No, have them measure something, right? Or I, I, we, I see a coach running a drill and they're spending the entire drill just yelling at every player what they should do every moment. That's not helping nearly as much as if you just measured it and then gave them the numbers afterwards, right? If we get our body fat measured, we're going to eat a little, little bit better. Right. But if we, if we, oh, I don't want to see my, I don't want to see the scale. Of course, we don't want to see the scale because we want to keep eating and drinking whatever we want to. When we measure stuff, we make better decisions. Lock left coaches, thanks for being on. And for those of you that are curious, thank you for being curious and jumping on as well. We'll see you guys soon.